challenge here, of course, and um, what we're going to be talking about today is how to get a speaking business that uh, makes serious money. And there's nobody better in South Africa to, to talk about that than Billy Telekani. Um, yeah. he, he certainly has the highest profile of speakers in South Africa. Um, he does mo more international gigs than anybody else. He's uh, uh, a spectacular speaker. But one of the things that um, you will find about Billy, and one of the things that I enjoy about Billy, is that he doesn't mind sharing. Um, he is uh, often mentoring other speakers, helping them along. Um, he has his own mentorship program, uh, which is very exciting. And it's one of the things that the PSA um, encourages, but uh, it's, we don't all get to. But Billy is the man uh, in encouraging uh, young and up-and-coming speakers. So, Billy, thanks very much for taking the time to join us this evening. I'm really looking forward to, um, to hearing what you have to say. I'm, I've never not learned something when I listen to you, Billy, so I'm hoping today will be just the same. So, over to you, Billy. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, the first time I saw you, I was meeting my hero. That's what we do. When you meet your hero, you run and hug them. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, sorry, just before you start, I just have a, a quick thing I need, I forgot to announce, and that is to everybody, as usual, we are recording the, the session. If there is something that gets said mm -hmm. that uh, you want me to edit out, please let me know, and I will make sure I do so. Uh, but I am recording the session. It's not for public, but just for the people who, uh, who normally attend who can't make it tonight. Okay, cool. Please All go right. ahead, Thank Billy. Thank you very much. I guess I'm going to start. Yeah, cool. Well, guys, you know, there it is, Million Dollar Speaker Business Blueprint. And I, and I think when I'm talking about a million dollar, I'm not taking, talking about it very lightly. I mean, we know a million dollars is about 12 million. So basically, if you are a speaker, and I'll show you later on that, you know, how your business should be divided. If in, in the life of your business, if you've been in the business for over, I don't know, eight, nine years, and you have not made a million, you, you're really not in the business. It's, it's, it's just as simple as that. You know, you really are, are trying the best that you can. And we all know that, uh, you know, if you divide a million by four years or so, it's doable. I usually say 48 months. It's exceptionally doable. And I'm going to take you through, you know, how I do it and how I think you should begin to look at your business. And basically, I'm going to talk about four things. The first one is what I call the speaker essence. You know, what really makes you stand out, you know, in the marketplace. I'm going to talk about the global opportunity. There's one massive opportunity that a lot of speakers are not understanding or they don't even see or know about. I'm going to talk about business model, you know, what kind of model are you using, you know, what, what should you be using. And there is no hard and fast rule. You no, know, this is the right way and this is the wrong way. There's that this model fits me or this model doesn't fit me. And then I'm going to talk about niches. Now, this has been a very big problem of mine for a very long time. And Eventually, I'm getting to solve because every speaker that I meet globally in, in the associations, they kept asking me, what is your niche? And I, you know, I remember when I met Zig Ziglar, I asked him the same question because they'll give me problems. You know? and, and then I said, so Zig, who's, what's, who's your niche? And Zig said to me something amazing. He said, 90% of Americans believe there's God, and that's my niche. And I said, wow, that's amazing. You know? And it has been troubling me, so I'm going to with you what I've discovered and what I think you should be looking at. And then we'll go to Q&A. All right. So I've always said that, you know, this is the speaking industry. And these are speakers. Everybody who has been everybody nowadays is a speaker. And it's quite set unsettling because a lot of corporates are comparing seasoned professionals with people that started speaking yesterday and they expect to negotiate prices based on these new guys that are showing up all over the show. However, I'm saying there are speakers and then there's the speaker. So you must choose whether you're going to become part of this whole, you know, uh, place or you're going to become distinct. And the difference is your positioning. Either you are seen as a commodity speaker or you are an authority. And a commodity speaker, they will always compare your price with the next person. They will compare your price with the previous speaker. They'll compare your price with other quotations. They'll compare your price with other people that they have on their, on their table because you're just a speaker, you are not an authority on a specific subject. Now, again, this is very much attached to niche. Because for a very long time, I had a, a beautiful challenge, which a lot of people liked, but I didn't like. Most of my clients did not call me in for a specific subject. They booked me for me. And almost 65% of my keynotes eventually became customized keynotes. 
And they would say to me, I've had you, if somebody had to speak in this conference and they liked A, B, C, and D, would like to become a speaker of people. And I'd go to the conference, I'd go to the two notes, I would search for the nuances that they picked up, I would send them a questionnaire, and based on what they're telling me and the keynote that I gave, I would then customize something that was you know, almost dear to them. And every time when I finished, they would say, man, you are amazing. You spoke to exactly our issues. So I ended up you know, doing a lot of customized keynotes, but not really saying they're customized because I've got an architectural process of keynoting, how to build it. And I'll just know I need to take this, take this one out, take this humor. However, that era of commodity speakers is gone and it's, it's gone. It's, it's never coming back. So people that will command the biggest fees or stand in front of the people that make the greatest decision are people who are not even perceived, but who are known to be authorities on specific subjects. So that's what you've got to begin to say, you know, what am I good at? You know, because, you know, everybody says that I speak about leadership, but, you know, really, I mean, it's like saying, I'm speaking about, you know, soft drinks, which soft drink are you speaking about? You know, so you've got to get to that level where you say you're authoritative. Now, I'm gonna share with you what really would make you a million dollar speaker. And, and, and there are three things that we get hired for. There are three things that run every speaker business. The first thing is your product or your content. What are you talking about? Your content, is it research content? Is it your signature story? Is it something that you've invented? Then is the value or the fee or the price of what you charge your customers to deliver this particular keynote or workshop or retreat or whatever. And then there's the, what we call customer experience. Now I've always said to people, if you were to take 100% and divide it into these three, what percentage of what do you think ultimately is the deciding factor? And a lot of people never get this right uh, because this has been based on sales experience and research would, Richard would know, he's one of the people that you know, does a lot of sales coaching. So research says that your content or your product amounts to 31% of decision making. So a customer will, will look at your content and 31% of the time they will choose either you're a good fit or good fit or a bad fit for their conference or for their engagement or for their strategy session. Now, the fee thing, it's, it's a fascinating thing because a lot of people think fee is big. Now, here's the percentage for fee, 13%. It's neither here nor there. You know, there are people that are getting paid in this country 250,000 a day to run a workshop. There are people who, for the full, for the full day, I paid 8,000, you know. There are people that are being paid 10,000 rand for a keynote. There are people that are being paid 45,000 rand a keynote. So surely price, it's a very small determinant of whether you really are gonna create magic for your business and grow it into a million dollar, like I said, within you know, 48 months. But what has been amazing for me, and this is just exceptionally true, is 53, 56% of the time, customers will book you because of the experience that you've delivered. And I can tell you now, we all know, you know within the advent of social media, videos this and videos that, people usually, would book you because somebody that they trust told them about you and told them the value and the experience that you gave them. It's like going to a restaurant, you know? They can put a video of a restaurant, but you have not tasted the food. But if somebody says, I've tasted the food, the service is amazing, you would go based on that information. So 56% of decision making is based on the experience that you give to the customers. And that for the past 15 years is what I have consistently focused on because for me, that has been my greatest return on investment. People book me because I delivered exceptionally on stage. And I delivered exceptionally on stage because I spent a lot of time, a lot of money, you know, learning from the best in the world, from actors, from directors, from production guys, from, from singers on how to really be on stage and own the stage and, and leave an indelible mark in the hearts and the minds of the customers, you know. So 56%, 56%, 56% is very, very important. It's what you give to your customers. And a lot of people don't really do this very well because a lot of people, they will spend a lot of time on content. It's good that you must have good content. A lot of people spend a lot of time trying to haggle on pricing. It's good that you should have, you know, we have this thing called fee integrity. But 56%, 56%, is, is what's important in this business. So I'm gonna show you a slide that will illustrate what I'm trying to say about this uh, 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 56%. So 
what customers want from us is consistent delivery, which means your brand and your content, your brand and your content should be giving that experience to your customers consistently. So that when people say, we've seen you, we've heard you speak, when you go and deliver to another customer, they must not come back and say, ah, you know, you said this guy was funny, you said this guy does this, but he didn't do those things. Because people always make notes and they sell you on the basis of that experience that other people shared with them. So I'm gonna show you two pictures of the same keynote in two different environments, a millisecond apart, so that you can understand what I mean when I'm talking about experience, that when you're on stage, you've got to deliver consistently. So I'm gonna show you the, 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 both the pictures and there'll be arrows that you know, delivers the story that I'm telling you. So these are two different uh, uh, dates. My, I'm, I'm dressed differently, two different stages, but the same keynote, the difference in milli, milliseconds. So let's start with the first arrow. If you look at this hand, in, in this keynote, it's where I'm beginning a point. You know, I'm saying something, and then here, I'm done saying it. But the difference between the two is so small, but you can see that if this was in slow motion, or it was created as a movie, you literally see the hand dropping and turning and looking up. So that's the first part. The second part, if you can look at my clicker, where I'm holding it, and look at the arrow that is going up, you can see exactly that when my one hand is up, the one is down, and when the one goes down, the other one goes up slightly. And if you look at my fingers of how I'm handling my clicker, it will tell you exactly that the difference between the two pictures is literally milliseconds. And then I'm gonna show you, if you look at my, my foot there, it's, it's facing up. Again, if you look at this one here, exactly the same, but the difference is again, a fraction of a second. If you look at my, my, my tie, where my tie ends vis-a-vis -vis my belt and the movement of my body, you'll see that it's exactly the same, even though the pictures are different, the suits are different. So this is what you call brand and content congruence that create the kind of experience that customers then would want to pay for or would share with other people. If you look at my tie, the distance between my tie and the shirt and the collar, you look at the same thing there, again, milliseconds, same knot, same way, same tie uh, distances, same body movement, and you can see the difference that it's exceptionally small milliseconds between, between the two. So what am I saying here? I'm saying if you get on stage, you will either sell yourself to many other keynotes to come, or you'll stop yourself from being booked by many other clients to come. So this is an illustration that for the past 14 years, I mastered the art of being on stage and delivering exceptional value that will make sure that I get booked over and over again. So my stage work has been much more effective for me, has been much more effective for me than my marketing and my all other things that we, we all do. And now I'm shifting and so I'll share with you later how the model is shifting. And you can ask me about this later. All right, so the first part I was just talking about the, speak, the, the speaker essence, that as a speaker, you've got to make sure that you deliver. And when you deliver, remember people are watching, people are taking notes when they recommend you, they recommend you specifically for the things that you do. So don't disappoint the person that has recommended you. That's why it's important that when people book me, I always ask them, how did you hear about me? Who told about me? Where did they see me speaking? What did they like? What did they not like? Because that behind the scene research is very important to make sure that you deliver excellently. So that's the, the speaker essence. The second one I'm gonna talk about what I call the global speaking uh, opportunity. Now, I, I read a lot of journals, you know, Harvard Business, Gallup, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, Thomas Reuters, just to find out what's happening around the world. And this slide here, it's a slide from the Gallup uh, group, Global Worker Status. So if you can see what it means, it says, you know, this is an amazing thing because it says 59% of workers globally are physically depleted, emotionally drained, mentally distracted, they lack in meaning and purpose. So there's opportunities for content. So if you are in a, in a place or you are an expert on, on, on wellness, there's a space for you. If you're an expert on emotional intelligence, there's a space for you. If you're an expert on whatever, you know, meaning and purpose, but then later on when I take you to the niches, you'll also see how it relates. So therefore it means the world is in trouble and who's gonna be helping the world is people like me and you. But if you're not aware of the challenges that this world is facing, 
when you also meet and negotiate fees or, or you know, road shows with your customers, you'll not be able to speak the language that they understand. And I can tell you now, this slide, when I, when I do bigger engagements and I speak with a CEO or a CEO or HR director, when I open it to them, you can see their face. They think, oh my God, this is so true. And then I tell them I can help you solve some of these problems, but not all of them. And I will take these problems that I'm seeing here and attach them to their cost to income ratio, their bottom line, and how it will affect their top line. And if you can be able to speak in this sense using real good data, you are able to, to, to command the fees that you want and create long-term engagement for yourself. So therefore, if this is, is where the world is, it means a lot of speakers are in the crossroads. We are in what's called Kairos, the Greeks call it the crossroads. What do we do? Do we keep being conference speakers? Do we build different business models? What is that we do? Do we write books to solve these problems? Well, let's talk about it. So the question then becomes, what is your business model? Like I'm saying, my business model has evolved. And I'll show you how it has evolved and how yours needs to begin to evolve. So there are two predominant models. The first one is the practice model. You're a one-man show, you've got a PA or a virtual PA, you're selling your time, you know, you're selling your time for money. And Alan Ways will tell you that's operating like, the, that's, that's the job of a plumber. So if nobody calls you, you're not making any money. It's unlike being a doctor, people pay medical aid and all those kind of things. So the practice model has got its own limitations, but some people then, because of the big online story, they're able to create a hybrid model that is both virtual and actual. The second one is the organizational model, where you've got many other people that are doing work for you inside an organization, paying them. The, the second one is a little bit risky because unless you are a true corporate thinker, you might find yourself in trouble because transitioning from a practice to an organization is a very difficult thing to do. Because in a practice model, you're the only person that manages yourself. You decide how much money you want to make, how you want to fly, business class, economy, whatever. So the decisions are for one person. When you're running an organization, the decision is for many people. And again, are you going to bring people that are going to be taking money from you or bringing, enhancing what you're doing? So both models, you've got to think very hard about it and say, going forward, what kind of model would work for you? And, and a lot of people that have, have done practice models, they, they've, they've limited themselves. Because even though there's a lot of opportunities online, which I'll share with you later, not all of us have got the capabilities to really make money online. So we need to be careful about what kind of model we take. You can create a hybrid model. We use one of the two. There is no hard and fast rule. You have to choose what works for you. And it's as simple as that. So for me, I've always said, that's why I'm saying a million dollars in 48 months. I've always said to people, as a speaker, you're running a business. And as you're running a business, you've got to have your own financial freedom plan. You know, when are you retiring financial? Meaning, when are you not going to worry when you're not paid on time? Because you've got enough reserves, you've got enough investment, you're making money in many other different ways. And until as a speaker, you define truly what freedom, financial freedom means for you, you're going to become addicted to the stage and addicted to sending invoices and receiving money from invoices. And eventually, it will be too late for you to turn things around. Because at some point in time, the phone is going to stop ringing and the invoices will not be paid on time. And you'll, have, you'll go through a big cash cow, cash, cash crunch. So, and I usually say to people, I don't know how you define your own financial freedom. You know, some people define their financial freedom by having lots of money in the bank. Some people say, when I'm, when I'm able to buy or build a, a property cash, that becomes an investment. I know that I'm there. Some people, it's about creating a collection because you've made so much money. Some people, is being able to afford the most expensive painting in the world. Some people, is buying private jets. Some people, is buying expensive watches that are collector's items. So I don't know what it means for you. But as a speaker, you've got to start thinking about it now and making sure that whatever model you deploy for your business will get you there. And, you know, when I'm talking about financial freedom, you must really have it in how many years, how long is it going to take, how much that money does it mean, and what kind of in extremes is this money going to be built on so that you really have a, have a goal and a plan. Because most of the time, a lot of speakers, when they're not being paid on time, they get into serious cash flow problems because... Most speakers get addicted to, being, to, to big invoices that are paid, but they don't really look for, they don't really create savings or buy different businesses or get into different investments. So as a speaker, don't get addicted to the stage and to the big money that you get paid. Think about the future and decide what financial freedom means for you and when is it going to be. It cannot become a perpetual plan. It must have a beginning and an end. So begin with the end in mind. Now, 
if we look at what a speaker does, a lot of people like the stage. It's a very beautiful place to be on stage. It's very addictive as well. But that's not the only way to make money. So there are ways in which we make money. We make money through keynote, we make money through coaching, we make money through facilitation, and we make money through consulting. So you keynote, you coach, you facilitate, and you consult. And I'll show you later what percentage of this comes through my income. Now, I did some research around online products. I'm still struggling a little bit. I would sell one or two things then and there, but I've never put some energy. But I have got a studio now and I'm digitizing a lot of my work. But this is the number. Digital products globally, $1.2 billion in the USA. That's a lot of money. And these are people that are creating eBooks, that are creating videos, that are creating a lot of how-to. And I'll show you in the private market with what sells, and, and you know, people that have never even spoken on a platform are making more money than a lot of platform speakers because they've understood their nuances and the created processes for them to set up an online business that is very profitable. And it doesn't take a lot, quite honestly, because a lot of the technology that's been used is open source. And if you pay for it, you don't really pay for an arm and a leg. Some people use Zoom, some people use, you know, all kinds of uh, technologies to really make a lot of money online. So this is 2016, now we're in 18, so I can imagine this market is going to up to 1.9 billion now. So there's a lot of money to be made online, but you, you better know how to do it because you, know, you can spend a lot of money buying technologies and buying all kinds of softwares for, for CRMs and not make any money. So you've got to know what to do. If you don't know what to do, get someone who has done it and let them help you do it. Now let me share with you my revenue split because each one of you has to ask themselves and say, your business has to be split in five. Keynotes, coaching, facilitation, consulting, and products. And where are you going to make your money? So the way that I make my money now has completely changed. So this is my percentage. I now make money from 15% of my keynote make me the money. It's no longer big money. 15% on coaching. Now coaching, I do high level coaching because coaching is really a lot of work and I'm a little bit I'm not good on one-on-one -on -one and it's kind of heavy. I do executive coaching, I coach executive teams. And if I coach a CEO or a head of state, which sometimes I do, the value has to be very high for me to do it. You know? So I would typically coach an executive, the fee would be between 180 and 250 a year. You know? So I don't need a lot. I don't need to be selling a lot of coaching. And then facilitation is 20%. Now facilitation is fascinating. Minimum is two days, maximum is three days. And for every three days, that includes writing a report, that would be about 220, 230. You know, so if you do three a month, you know, that's about nine days work. You do the numbers, it's big. And then consulting, for me, I have strategically grown my consulting business and I'm making 40% of my revenue now because most of my consulting work is multi-year. So I'm doing a lot of work in the culture space and the minimum contract that I do is 18 months, but 18 months, that is 22 physical days I spend with the client and the rest of the time I support them online. And the minimum, I am not willing to get into any engagement that is less, less than 1.8 million for 22 physical days, 18 months in intervention and online support. I am not willing to do that and I'm getting the money. I'm actually even getting more because I have really nailed it down. I understand how to speak the CEO's language I have just recently come back from Chicago. I did an accreditation course for a very powerful tool. That's now going to take me to the next level. So consulting for me, it's my, my new driver. That's where I'm going because that's where the big money is. Because that's where you'll make 100 million because you can deploy other consultants to work on your behalf. On your behalf. So for me, that's the vision. And then, of course, it's products. At the moment, I'm making 10% of my money from products. And I've got a team, uh, Richard knows about it, that's a very powerful video team. And like I'm saying, everything that I've written, that I've facilitated, I am now digitizing it so that I can have a one or two people that will be running a very robust online business for me that will create revenues that I want. So if you look at how I make my money, for me, the two big ones now is facilitation and consulting. Now, when I'm saying 15% keynote, let me, contextualize it for you. It means that some keynotes, I don't do them for a fee because I'm selling the big consulting fee. And the other 15, the 15% 15 will be actual revenue that I'm getting, that I'm called in a conference that I'm being paid. But most of the time I'll be on stage where I'll cut a deal with the customer that will come and speak to your ex -co. I'll speak to your, to your junior managers. I'm not charging a fee, but I'm, I'm selling this, you know, long-term intervention 
And when I have half a day with them, I will sell and close it. And I will walk out of there. So instead of charging them 40,000 rand for a keynote or 45,000 for a keynote, I'm going to charge them 1.8 million for a keynote, which means I'm going to speak for half a day, take them through this process. I'm going to sign a deal for 22 days that runs over 18 months and I've made 1.8 million. So that for me, it's, it's my strategy and it's working like a charm and I really love it. So wherever you are in your business, think about where you're going to make most of your money in this model. And you can either do this on your own, like I said, as a practice, or you can look at it as an organization where you can have other coaches. Some people have got products that they can license. You can sell other facilitators to do your work for you. You can get other consultants that are working within the same space like you. But one of the dangers of using external contractors, you must have very tight contracts because you're in the knowledge business and most people like to cut corners. So chances of people taking your content and uh, running away with it are very, very high. So you decide what you want to do, whether you want to have, you know, very tough contracts. I don't know. You know, I just simply have good contracts. And, you know, I, I tell people that, you know, this is a long game. You, if you think in short term, I'm not going to work with you. So I've been quite fortunate that a lot of external consultants that I use have been very loyal to me and, you know, we've been doing very good deals. So you've got to decide where you're going. And, and by the way, this is the model. This is, this is the revenue speed of any speaker that wants to stay in this business in the long term. Because there are very few people who are true keynoters. I was one of those. But I've changed my model. Because I've been traveling the world and sometimes it's really tiring. You, you slap around the country to go to Singapore for one keynote. You lose three days. Yes, you're going to charge a lot of money, but when you come back, was it worth it? So you go through these motions and you decide you know, how you want to do it. But this is the mix that is working globally. And a lot of people that I work with are doing exactly the same thing that I'm doing. So it really works. So think about it and think, think about how you want to split your business. So my route to market is quite simple. I serve three markets, the government, private sector, and small, medium enterprises. How am I serving them? In the private sector, I'm doing a lot of work in the medical scheme. I'm doing aviation. I'm doing bank. And, I'm, and, I'm, and the web bureau, I'm putting a question mark. This year, if I have had five or six deals from bureau, it has been like a lot. So, you know, bureaus for me are neither here nor there. It's one of those things that, you know, it just doesn't work for me. And it's okay. For some people, it works. And what do I do for this sector, for the private sector? Inspirational keynotes, organizational culture, and coaching. Now, most of my keynote, like I said, if you look at the 15% I told you, most of my keynote are selling keynotes instead of keynote for the sake of keynoting. So I've sort of changed that in a way. And some, in some instances, you know, I would be, somebody says, you know, come talk to me and I'll check what company is it? Is it worth me doing? Some keynotes I don't take, you know. So it's, it's sort of like I want to go where I can sell more. Or where I feel I'm adding value. And then with the, in, the, in, the, in the government space, state-owned enterprises, departments, and local municipalities. This is a very risk area, very risk business. They don't pay on time. The work is too much. It doesn't, it doesn't really make happen. But if you get a good state-owned enterprise and they respect you, you will make some serious money. I have worked with quite a few of them, and I've held very long-term relationships that have given me very good returns. And what do I do for them? I facilitate. I do keynotes, organizational culture, and coaching. But mostly here, it's facilitation and organizational culture. I've done a lot of work for the city of Johannesburg. I've done a lot of work in, in the Eastern Cape. I've done a lot of work in, uh, in, in, in uh, Tswane. I'm not doing any work in Egoblene because of political reasons. But I can tell you now, every time that I've done work, especially in the city of Johannesburg, I've actually worked for them for about four years. And I've made some serious revenues from them, from, from facilitation, some serious, serious revenues. And for small, medium enterprises and the solopreneurs, I do coaching. There's a friend of mine who has designed a very powerful app for coaching. He's testing it, and when it's ready and it works, I'll probably get him to come and introduce it to PSA. It's a very amazing tool. You can coach 20, 30, 40, 50 people at the same time. It's very robust. You preload content. You know, you've got pre, you know, pre-answers. It's a fascinating tool. So I'm going to do that with a lot of solopreneurs. Now, one of the things that I do, again, with entrepreneurs, I, I state clearly that I coach successful entrepreneurs. Because again, my minimum coaching is 150 for these guys. I don't coach a guy that says, I've started a business six months ago. Oh, Mr. Silicon, what can I do? I say to him, good luck, my brother. I'll pray for you, but I don't have the time to spend with you. Come to my free mentoring or whatever, and I'll share with you what I know. But I don't expect those guys to be able to pay me. So I say, state clearly that I coach successful entrepreneurs that want to take their business to the next level. So for me, this is my route to market. Now, how do I 
go to this market. The first one, I'm sure you guys have heard about it, freemium. That's it. Give a free keynote, sell something that is of high value. Now, a lot of people, I don't see them doing that. And I don't see a lot of people speaking at associations. You know, every day, there's an association, a Rotary Club, an association of accountants, panel beaters, you name it, that have a meeting somewhere that would appreciate a speaker. And if you go there and you, you trade your time in your keynote for their database, you can then... Very fascinating formula that I use. So what I do is I usually go to five of my top clients, you know, which I have a very solid relationship with. And I speak to the CEO and I ask them a very simple question. Who of the five people, custom, who of the five businesses do you spend most of your revenue with? And they will tell me. And I'll say to them, I'm going to do you a favor. I want us to do a client appreciation session. So it's simple. Five CEOs, five people each, that's 25 people. Now, when you use the CEO that's spending money with them, he's got leverage, he's got influence. They are going to come because the invitation comes from him, not from me. But he says, come and spend half a day with me. I've got this guy who's great in this transitional culture. He's going to share this with us. And what I do, I then buy books. Whatever books that are in the market that are available, I pre-read the book, one or two books. I pre-mark the book for everybody. I prepare a very beautiful package. I get the client, by the way, I get the client to book a very cool, expensive hotel because it's his brand and it's his leverage and it's his, you know, so they like it. You know, they like to show off that, you know, I took guys out, nice hotel, and I brought you this guy, he spoke with you, he gave you some stuff. And I spent half a day doing subliminal selling, teaching but selling at the same time. And I'm, my, my objective is quite simple. I want to close five of the 25. And how much do I want to close? I don't want anything that is less than two million out of these guys. So it's simple. 25 people in a room, half a day, give them content like they've never seen, close five of these guys, <clears throat> minimum two million, multi-year. Again, five of them give you 10 million. Very simple. This formula works, guys. Try it. I promise you, you'll be surprised that this is actually one of the greatest, most solid way to connect and sell to people in ways that it's, it's just amazing. So this is a very powerful formula that I've used for years and I'm still using it now. And then strategic videos. Now I send videos every Monday. I've not sent them for the past two weeks because we are re-recording and editing and doing stuff. Now I send out videos to my network every Monday morning at uh, sometimes quarter to nine, sometimes 20 to nine, quarter to nine, depending on what time I finish my radio program. Now most of these videos are not selling videos. Strategic videos in the sense that I talk about subjects that you know, interest people, I'm selling nothing. But then there are those that are selling videos, which I send to specific people. And who are these specific people? Usually the people that come from the 5.5 formula or people that say CEO X has just been taken over, he's a new CEO, he's not sure what to do. I'll then create a five, eight minute video about the first 100, 100 days. And I'll send it to this guy and say, hi, I'm Billy Silicone. I'm totally you new, you know, with my experience working with CEOs, Here's a very powerful strategy on how to do the first 100 days. Through this process, I was able to sell into a customer, again, a multi-year uh, 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 intervention for 3.5 million. How much does it cost me to do these videos? Not a lot of money, but I researched the video, I scripted them proper, I shoot them, and I edit them professionally, and I put the log of the company, and I send it to this particular person specifically so that they feel exceptionally special. It's a very powerful tool. I'm going to learn to find it so that I can become better and good at it. But so far, so good. It has created a lot of awareness for me in places that I want awareness, and it has gotten me a deal. And therefore, the potential of it getting me more deals is very high. And lastly, platform subliminal selling against the 5.5 strategy. But when I go to stages, I choose which stages I go to because I'm going there to both sell and to really give content and deliver value to, to customers. So these are the mechanics that I use to go to market. Now, there's uh, my LinkedIn and my Facebook and all of those things. I sometimes get tired of them because the people that I pay me, the amount of money that they pay me, don't care if I'm on Facebook. Don't care if I'm putting things on Instagram or whatever. But some of them do read LinkedIn. So LinkedIn is a place which I'm, 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 I'm really becoming solid. And I'm putting together, like I said, a, a very solid digital team that will work on all my digital things. 
So these are the five, you know, the five, the four things that I use to go to market. So you can ask me questions later. We will discuss them in detail. Now, as I said, you have to decide which way you're going, which right is your right. Now, for me, in this year, beginning of this year, I decided that I'm going to have what I call the game plan 2080, that what am I doing in the next five years? I, I've put together a new team. I've decided on the niche that I'm working in. I'm digitizing and I'm rebranding. So you've got the Billy Silicon brand and the consulting company is called Intelligent Edge Consulting. I've actually stepped down from being the CEO on the executive chairperson. I've hired an Indian lady who's now the CEO of that business and her responsibility is to drive the business and I'm remaking at a much more higher level. So this is my game plan going forward and it is working like a child. Now, you've got to understand and choose your niche. Again, you cannot become anything to everybody. You know, in some instances, I refuse to do things that I used to do long, long time ago because I know they'll just diminish my value and not increase my value. So if you look at the speaking world, there are many speakers, there are celebrities, there are ex-CEOs, there are athletes, there are people that won this game, there are people that climb the mountain, everybody climbs the mountain nowadays. You know, some people will fight lions or whatever. So the choice is so wide. Again, you can't become a commodity speaker anymore. You've got to become an authority. Because a lot of people are going to come and take our money. And those are the ex-CEOs, the ex-HR directors, the ex-sales directors, the ex-ops you know, directors. Those guys are bringing tangible value because they've run big corporations. And when they talk to COX and say, I've run a company of 8,000 people. Now you tell me, if a guy says, I've run a company of 8,000 people, I'm going to share these seven strategies. And here's a speaker who's been speaking for eight years. He's going to share the strategy. Who's going to be paid and who's going to be hired? I bet you the CEO that has been running a company of 8,000 people. So the game is changing. You've got to become an authority. Now let's look at uh, in the private side. When I'm talking about private, I'm talking about the people that sell to, to, to customers, you know, B2C. You, you, you're running your business selling to individual customers. So there are three major niches in the private environment. The first one is health and fitness. There's a lot of money in weight loss and stress in natural healing and wellness. I mean, people are into retreats, people are into eating this, people are into not eating this, people are searching for different ways of making things happen. So if you are an expert in this field, there's a lot of money to be made. The second one is dating and relationships. Dating, marriage, parenting, and sex, sexuality. We all know sex sells, you know? We all know about it. So if you are dating an expert or a relationship expert, the market is open and people are hungry. Now, these are people that will usually buy your products online and they'll attend retreats and not sellathons, not those seminars where people are selling all kinds of products, but people want intimate environments where they can go out with great value. So there's a big market for that. And the last one is business and money. You know, real estate, property, investing, making money, marketing. Marketing, digital marketing online has become exceptionally big. Everybody and anybody who runs a business, they want to understand the digital space. You know, Charlotte is now a futurist. There's a great future for her. She's making um, amazing things out there. And so do a lot of people. So these are the three major niches if you're selling to individuals. If you're like me, you're selling to businesses and corporates. Again, health and wellness, employee and executive wellness, workplace happiness, and workspaces, you know, the workplace of the future. These are big topics. And again, you can't be a dabbler. You either bring in some serious value because you have walked the path or you've designed it, or whatever, you can't just dabble and read five books and seven expert because people are really, really, really smart. But they're big markets in health and wellness. Leadership and relationships, leadership trends, employee engagement, organizational culture and team effectiveness. I'm loving it. I mean, I've spent a lot of my time and money, you know, sharpening my, my, my sword around organizational culture. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm positioning myself to becoming, in the next two or three years, the go-to guy as far as organizational culture is concerned in the continent. And it's happening. So, and people want value. People want you to give them, this is what I've done. This is what has worked. Speak to the CEO, speak to this organization. You can't just be winging it and getting your friends to write you testimonial letters. People want empirical data now. It's becoming tough. And business and man, BPR, you know, business process engineering, productivity, sales and marketing, workplace of the future, digital business, and business strategy. So these three major niches, they are three, but they are six. If you want to grow your business, you've got to say to yourself, in all of this, where am I a specialist? And how do I position myself to become a true authority in these spaces? So those are the two different niches. And that's my thing, ladies and gentlemen. Now we can have a conversation and ask questions and answer them. I'm going to get out of the 
presentation mode so that I can see people as well. Are we good, guys? We are indeed, Billy. That was fantastic. Thank you. If you can just stop the sharing, then we'll be able to all see each other full uh, screen, yeah. and that would be very useful. I've stopped sharing, yes. We can now see each other. Okay. Cool. Uh, we're still getting your sharing view. There yeah, we go. go. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Now we can see everybody. Um, those of you, I have stopped a couple of people's video because it was a bit distracting with all the movement, but you may want to re-enable it now. That would be fantastic. Let's, uh, let's get some questions for Billy. Um, uh, thank you very much, Billy. That was uh, very good, but let's see if we've got some questions for you. Cool. Yes, I, I have a question. Yes, Carl. El Presidente. Billy. <laughs> thank you, Billy. That, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank just you. a question. I, I, I love the whole leadership thing and uh, the culture and all that kind of stuff. But the other thing that I really, really love and I find that I'm quite good at nowadays is, is the business strategy side. Yeah. Um, are those separate uh, or can they be thrown together? Well, you know what, Carl? Strategy is a separate space, but leaders drive strategy. So you've got to find a way to create incongruence between the two, but you can't make them a kind of, if you do this, you've got to do the other. You know, in a yeah. lot of instances, there are people who are complete strategy specialists and they don't yeah. do anything on leadership. Because strategy is process mapping, is you know, doing those things on the chart and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So you've got to find a way. And, and again, where, where's your greatest... Uh, uh, kind of uh, testimonies. Is it on delivering strategy? Is it on reviewing strategy? You know, I facilitate strategic planning sessions, but I tell people I'm not a strategist, but I understand the, the process, but I'm not a strategist, but I understand. Okay. The Therefore, I can be in the room, help you to deal with your strategy, but I'm not necessarily a strategist. So you've got to decide how you position it. And again, remember what I said, the way that you position it must also be based on the work that you've delivered. On. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Very helpful. Pleasure. Thanks, Billy. Who's got? Who's next for the question? <laughs> Billy. Um. Billy. Sorry. Go ahead, Anya. Thank you. Um. So, Billy, thank you so much. That was really a lot of wisdom in a very short time span. Appreciate <laughs> that. Um, when you explained the five times five, that concept that my line went um, a little bit fuzzy, do you mind just explaining that briefly again? Okay. So what I do is I look at five of my top clients, guys that I've got a very serious relationship with, usually CEOs, guys that have got uh, influence. Then I ask him, I ask each one of them, say, so your business, where is it spending most of his money? Which, which service providers are you spending most of their money and strategically so and they'll tell you that guy that guy that guy I said to him okay fine what i want to do is i want to i want i want to do a client appreciation session so each ceo is going to invite five of his people you know so we'll have 25 people in a room and these 25 people are influencers either ceos hr directors or cfos influencers because you're using the leverage of this guy that is spending money with them you know so it's a very powerful leverage. And I prepare in such a way that out of the 25, I usually say, I want between three and five. I want to close between three and five. And I put a figure on this three and five that how much I want to make with them. And what is it that I specifically want to close with these people? And when I prepare for this session, I, I bring books, I bring real cool stuff for them. I've read the book on their behalf, I've marked it, I bring videos, I bring all kinds of things, and I give them. And they love it because they walk away with, with value. So for the half a day, I'm going to be teaching them high content, but I'm selling in the moment. And at the end of that, some of them, because it was not me who invited them, it was the person that spends money with them, they feel obliged to spend money with me, but it must be reciprocated by the value that you give. Make sense? Yes, thank you so much. Cool. Great strategy. Thank you, Billy, for that. Let's see. Any more questions from anybody else? Yes, Ian Dormin here. I also want to ask a question on the 5.5. .5. I find it incredibly interesting. Thank you for that, Billy. Now, Billy, me that's, for instance, just starting off, and I do not have CEOs and people like that yet. Yeah. How do you, um, do you then propose that I take the client that I do have and yeah. hope to build up my own career? I hope that they have someone that's on the next level. And as I get them as clients and I go to the next level, or 
how would you propose someone that's starting at the bottom use the same strategy to go ahead? Well, you've got to ask yourself that who's your ultimate buyer? Who's the ultimate person that buys you? Yeah. Once you've identified your buyer, you then, you then create an architectural journey to the buyer. You know, yeah. if your buyer is your HR director, you've got to get them in the room. So I've always said to people, and, and, and now I, I don't like to talk to people who want to go to talk to other people. You know, like you talk yes. to guys, yes. I'm going to talk to your boss. I say, I want to talk to your boss. And I tell them with the greatest ability, I, I can sell myself better than you can actually sell myself, you know, sell me to your boss. So for me, that's the kind of place that I, that I, that I, I pitch at. And by the way, you've got to know these people that you're selling to. You've got to create an avatar. I don't know if you guys know this process. No. Hmm. Well, an avatar, it simply says, who's your buyer? What is their problem? What are their pain points? What keeps them away? Yes. And what is it that you can solve for them instantly for them to see value in you? And then we're going to say, where do I find these people? Are they playing golf? Are they playing tennis? Are they going to theater? You've got to map them out in such a way that if you go to a, let's say you go to a ballet, go there because you know seven CEOs go to ballet. Find a way to meet them. And when you meet them, don't talk business. Talk about them. You know, ask them about them. What business are they in? Blah, blah, blah. Build that rapport. And most speakers, because we, 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 like, we are very assertive people, the mistake that we make is we talk so much about ourselves and so little about, what, about our customers. So find the buyer, who's the buyer, you know, create an avatar for the buyer and find where they go, find what their pain points are. Even if when you write an article on LinkedIn, write it for that particular person to which you want them to buy from you. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah. Lois, did you have a question? I see you got your hand raised. I did, Ian, but I think Billy's already answered it in answering the, the previous question, so I can now lower my hand. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Excellent. Other questions? Anybody? I'm seeing some shaking of the heads. <laughs> Billy, do you have any closing comment or are you done? Well, the closing comments that I have is you've got to look at your business not as a speaking business. You've got to look at it as a, a high-value business driven by speaking. You know, speaking drives the bigger business. It's not, speaking is not the be-all and end it all. And a lot of people have got this, it's, it's kind of an illusion. I want to be a top speaker, be on stage and whatever. This is business, guys, you know. You consult, you coach, you facilitate, and you speak. You know, don't have this obsession about, I want to become this the keynote. The market has changed. People are, have changed the way they do things. You've got to be agile and adapt to what the market is saying and make sure that you build a business that can be sustainable. Because sometimes, you know, like now, a lot of people, it's, we're getting closer to conference time. There's going to be a lot of inquiries. But guess what? There's also all kinds of speakers coming from the woodwork who are going to undercut you on price. Okay. I'm not in the price game anymore, you know. So, and, and I always say to people, and people know, don't call me and tell me about price. I'm, I'm not interested to talk to anybody that's going to call me and say, oh, but you don't have a budget. Why did you call me? You know, don't, don't. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good stuff. Thank you very, very much, Billy. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance. Um, uh, sorry, uh, Carl, please go ahead. Okay, so Carl, you're busy uh, on your way out. Okay, I just didn't read the whole message yet. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Billy. We appreciate your, your bringing your vast experience and wisdom to us and your latest strategies. So it's, uh, it's so great to hear somebody share so vulnerably about where you're at and what's happening. So it's uh, fantastic. It's really appreciated uh, all the value you've added to our lives. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again at, a, at one of the conferences. Oh, definitely next year. Definitely. See you there. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, everybody. Um, and enjoy your evening.